Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome, marketers, advertisers, and those who love them to Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, the decisions, and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former Chief Marketing Officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here today with my guest, Sally Henderson. Today's topic, Behind Closed Doors, Part 2, The Things CMOs Discuss in Private. Now, Sally started her career as a branding and marketing recruiter and became a full-time leadership mentor and coach over 13 years ago. She currently runs Sally Henderson, what an interesting name, where she is a high-stakes leadership mentor. She currently mentors C-suite leaders and has coached over 5,000 people since starting the business. She is coming to us from across the pond in London. Welcome, Sally. Thank you, Mike. A thrill to be here. Glad to have you. So, Sally, starting right along on our theme of what happens behind closed doors, give us a quick overview of the dominant themes you're hearing just from leaders in general today. And just for our, our listeners' perspective, I've asked Sally to focus more on leadership development versus technical skills. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So Sally, tell us the dominant themes you're hearing. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think what I'm hearing behind closed doors is a lot of breath out, to be honest. People are going, oh, thank goodness. Like We're in a new cycle. We're in a new year. And hopefully this year is going to be one that people can get stuck in. Let, you know, let's just hope those curveballs, those world macro curveballs, um, we don't have a global pandemic that, you know, we can get a little bit of stability back in the world. Um, so I think people are ready to really drive forward. Um, there's been a lot of coping, a lot of reacting, understandably so. And that will always continue. But I think there's a real appetite to move. And to do that, what I'm really hearing through the lens of the work that I feel very privileged, privileged to do is a need for two things. Pace with space. OK, so people want to move at pace to get important things over the line, to get things moving and to really capitalize on momentum that is coming back. But what we cannot forget at our peril is the need for space to allow the pace to happen well, because what's not been happening over the last few years for lots of reasons that everyone knows, you know, don't need me to articulate them again, but COVID, you know, global disruption, awful wars having a massive impact across the globe. What leadership teams, and especially C-suite leadership teams, have not had is space. Space to take that breath, you know, and to just go, okay, who are we as a team? Where are we at? And how do we really have the time, the pure time, to simply connect as a team? Because that's- and, and in, this, in this space question, I want uh -huh. to jump on that a little bit, because what I hear is, and, and, and I, I'm hearing some of this as well, is the space is also the time to actually let things develop versus demand to get it all done. And and the, the COVID stuff and then the potential recession or maybe we're not going to have a recession or, you know, all the wars and everything is like, oh, my God, you got to do everything right this minute. And a lot of strategy might have gone out the door there. Is that also what you're saying? Yeah, I think we've learned that strategy is only as fit for the environment it has to work in, both in the short and the longer term. So the word pivot, I think no one wants to hear it for a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> and, and the word agility and resilience, I think everyone's a bit over those. Um, but I think from my angle, it's the human space, Mike, that I'm referencing in that having just dedicated time, and I'm going to be a bit dramatic, and I don't mean this as literally as I'm saying oh, it. No, no, go be dramatic, be dramatic. Almost the time to do nothing, yeah. okay? The time just to be in a room, in person, with your partners in crime, with the exec team, where you're not simply on adrenaline to get through the agenda. You know, when you've got so many business and people issues, strategic issues, creative issues, commercial issues, and goals and opportunities that are just not, there's not enough space for those in the agenda normally in business as usual. But what gets squished 
at peril from my angle all the time is space for the team, the exec team to work on themselves. And part of that, part of that says that's, I'm not having enough time to truly discuss my strategy and where we're actually going. And two, I, I mean, I know one of your things is leaders are often unclear as to what I'm, I am here to do type of question. And I think when you pile on a ton of execution and a ton of pivot and agility and resilience, and we got to get this done tomorrow. Um, I think one of your themes would be the leader isn't sure what his or her job is when, when you kind of change it that way. Am I getting that right? Um, that what am I here to do thing and how it's manifesting itself now be, behind closed doors or not? Yeah, I'm going to back up the bus a little bit because I think the space and time to look at the strategy is there. What is yeah. missing is the space and time for the exec team to know how they're going to show up at their absolute best to best lead and deliver that strategy. OK, the nuance around connection, support, trust, um, backing each other and being ahead of the curve of that leadership need individually and collectively within the team to make sure that the goals that have been set, strategy that's been agreed can actually happen in the most effective way. And with building on your point there around the job. So it might interest you when I'm working with my clients, especially one on one, I specialize at the C-suite level. And I will often ask these two questions at the beginning. And I'll ask them in a very direct and very um, accountable way, right in the eye. <laughs> I'll first ask, how are you? And you'll often in England, you'll get not bad. <laughs> which not is bad, never, right. Because England never would great, never admit. Never they got to have a step way. upper lip going and everything. <laughs> yeah. No way yeah. I'm going to admit, admit like that. If that's, if that's yeah. your base level, we've got work to do. Um, but they often aren't asked that question without any agenda, Mike. If you think about it, everyone in the workspace who's asking, how are you? Um, and it's a very polite British thing to do that all the time, just to kind of soften soften any conversation. People don't actually care. <laughs> it's just a polite way of going, can we get into it? Right. So C-suite people are not often used to being asked genuinely without any agenda, just how are you? And often they don't even know that about themselves because they haven't had time or space to think, actually, do you know what? How am I right now? How are my emotions, my inner beliefs, my subconscious showing up that's very much affecting how I'm thinking and acting but most often subconsciously when it comes to the emotional lens. So I really always start by just checking in, how is someone feeling? Because that's going to dictate how they're performing. The second question I ask them, which really shocks them because it's so bloody simple, is can you just tell me what your job is? And often they look shocked. They go, what, what do you mean? I'm the C whatever of wherever, and it's all very high profile and everyone knows what my job is. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get that. But I want you to look me in the eye now and off the cuff, just tell me, what is your job? And they'll do two things, Mike, normally. They will either look up to construct and make it up as they're no. talking to me, like, oh, God, what is the answer to this very direct, nowhere to hide question? And I don't mean job title, okay? Right. It's like, what are you here to do? What's your so purpose? It's really an outcome-based question. Like, when, when you're done, what's going to have happened? Because it's you the purpose, done. Mike. It's the purpose linked to the benefit of doing that purpose in a lovely, simple, very clean human sentence. Or what they'll do is they'll look down to reflect and remember and think, God, what was on the job spec I, I signed off <laughs> when I joined? It's not a current knowledge of in this moment, can you very simply articulate what your job is and the benefit that's going to land in the right tone, in the right language so that it's meaningful, but also really importantly, motivating. Because often when C-suite people tell me what they answer that, but what they don't realize, because it's not something that's current or effective, their body language sinks. And they they all they kind of deflate a bit and their voice tone goes quite bored because they don't quite know how to answer the question because nobody asks them. So if you're listening to this, well, you obviously are, but when you're listening to this, just ask yourself the question. Um, get yourself now, press pause and say out loud, what is your job and what's the benefit bring? And just well, see how can, I, can I circle back and combine these two questions? Because one of the For things sure. said in the beginning is people aren't having enough time, enough space to really think this through. Then you get all this pressure to do everything right now. Um, and then a lot of times on, on this show in particular, for a lot of CMO things, a bunch of people said the job spec is no good. And it's, not. And it's, it's not. no good. And so when you get, when I combine all those things, you got to do everything right now. You got to pivot, you got to be agile. And 
why are you here? To, what are you here to do? And then if you go back to your job spec and it isn't right, how do companies and leaders get this high without being able to answer this question? Because they're blooming talented, <laughs> okay? Yeah. They are natural high performers and they can cope without this clarity. However, it is not equipping them. And everyone makes assumptions. Oh, you're the CSO, the CMO. I know what that means. And they won't be entirely wrong. However, they won't be accurate. So let me illustrate. If I asked everyone now listening, including ourselves, to come up with a color in our minds that is green. I always pick green. I don't know why. I just like it. But if everyone now right. thinks you know of that. the color green, we will all be right, 100% right, because green is green. Okay. But, but you might have lime green or chartreuse or. You're but ahead of me, Mike. Greens. You're ahead of me, but people don't reference it. People don't check in and go, can I just check what you mean by green? Okay. And if you say, right, let's just Pantone. We've all gone off in our roles. Or we all think so and so is here to deliver green to make this very simplistic. And then they're thinking, why am I getting frustrated? Because we have agreed green, but it's not working or delivering the results that we want. And the, the CMO or the C-suite person is thinking, why is no one really buying into what I'm doing? Because it's the best green I've ever done. <laughs> and, then you, and then you go, My hey. My color green is fantastic. <laughs> uh -huh. And then you just go, let's just Pantone reference, shall we? And even if we're both Lyme, there's a guarantee we're still different. Yeah, because we haven't got accuracy. So the good news, Mike, and I'm very quickly going to do this because I want us to have a full conversation, but I have a framework that I created called the five R's. It's part of my model uh, stamp in my leadership development program, the real method. And these are the five R's you need to know to get clarity on what is your job, okay, and to set you up as a high performance team. And this can work for the team and individuals and can cascade throughout the whole organization because you don't want some boring, don't sue me document that's a job spec, okay, that lives in HR and nobody wants to read a load of words. Okay, I think well, we, we've also we've had re uh, academics on the show that said 50% of the marketing job specs are wrong. They're not they just are. off. They're wrong. Yeah. So the job spec. Yes, I, I get the green comment. If I think okay. I'm, I'm painting in lime green and you really want, you know, deep sea yeah. foam green, we're going to be very different. We are. And interestingly, with words, people can read words that mean different things. So the words are the same, but the out the outtake can be vastly different. With this model, you you avoid that. So it's very simple. There are five R's that you need to know about your team's performance and your individual performance. And you can take it across the whole company. Firstly, that piece around role. What is your purpose? What's the mission that you are here to do in the right language and the benefit land that that's going to deliver? Okay. So for example, I'm a high stakes leadership mentor. I specialize in working with senior teams and leaders to equip them with the practical and emotional toolkit to Excel. Boom, that's me, okay? I love those words. Every word has sweated to get its place in that statement, which I have said very quickly. <laughs> um, but that guides me as my North Star every day. And it tells you a lot about how I do what I do, in what situations, with who, and why they should bother, all there. The second thing you need to know is your role. So that's your why, okay? The second thing is your role, it's your what. What are you here to do in terms of remit? And what you do is you list five buckets, just five buckets, and the magic pill comes from percentage weighting these. So say you're here to drive people, culture, commercials, ops, and strategy. I'm just plucking out some very generic elements. If I percentage weight those so they all add up to 100, and I, and I index heavily on 60% strategy, it is, instantly gives you a real focus on the real kind of essence and outcome of the job. If I change that percentage to focus on ops, totally change the jobs, can be the same words, but that percentage weighting of those five buckets over say a year helps you understand what is the actual stuff you'll be getting your hands on and does it fit? And is it going to motivate you and fit your skill set? And by doing that percentage weighting, you can also compare and contrast with your peers. And what you do is you take that as an overall for the year, but you say, right, if that's my overall for the year in line with the rhythm of the organization and what we have to deliver, et cetera, what's my first quarter rhythm, uh, sorry, remit got to be? So if I overall of the year, I'm going to do 60% on that. To get that 60% to be an aggregate, I actually have to spend 80% on it in my first quarter. Otherwise, I won't make it land. So it's not a, the five R's is not a fixed thing. It's a framework that moves and you, re, you revisit it and you check in on the efficiency. But when you've got a framework, other people can quickly clean see on one page, what are you here to do? So that's remit, percentage weight it. You then go to rhythm. 
Now, rhythm is your how. Remember, we've got our why, our what, and now we've got our how. How are you going to set up to deliver this role brilliantly in terms of cadence, check-ins, um, on daily, monthly, weekly, annually, for yourself, for your family, for the team that you support, the different perhaps um, departments or geographies that you have to work with in your role, especially, you know, CMO. What's the rhythm that's going to underpin success? So it's a fluid, efficient rhythm, both between your private and your um, pers- uh, sorry, professional world. We're nearly there. Number four, results. What what do you got to do? What What's the rubber on the road? What's success going to be looked like in metrics? What are you going to measure? And how does that then con- compare and contrast with your remit? So if you've got a huge commercial outcome that you have to deliver from new revenue, but your remit only gives you 10% to focus on new revenue, that's probably out of kilter. Therefore, are the, are, the, are the greens aligned or what needs to give? Because I say to my clients, I hate to tell you, you're a finite being. <laughs> You only have 100%. You do not have 120, not even 105, okay? So if you're set up to always be working at a job that's needing more than one person, which is a thrill as well as a demand, it's going to be a hard ask. And then the final piece, once you've got the results um, agreed, and often they get assumed again. Results in terms of that clarity of what does that actually mean often just gets assumed, especially in new, new jobs. That's when it's really tricky. And the last piece of the puzzle is reward. Why are you even bothering? Where's your fuel going to come in to make all those other things work well? So you need to know as a senior C-suite leader in this exciting senior role with loads of pressure and opportunity, how are you gaining personally across your skills? How do you want to, your knowledge and experience? How do you want to feel? And what's the remuneration piece, the practical piece? So, so I get I get the I get the structure. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things, having, having done this a couple of times is, no matter how I structure my team, no matter how well I work it, I'm going to run into all these other structures in the company, and they're never going to they're never going to stay the same. And also, the one structure that almost always overrides everything, no matter how good you are, is if the financials start going south, all the structure goes to pieces. So, how do you manage yourself and all these things when there is? pressure to destroy the space you know the space that we talked it, about early yeah it's a great it's a great point i think the structure piece i i mentioned just then i think you've got to have good foundations and you've got to have good frameworks and tools no matter what they are that work for you that help you do a quick check in so yeah. when when the proverbial hits the fan if you don't have the right structures and foundations upon which to check how to use yourself differently you're going to knee jerk panic but if yeah. you've got that framework, well, you think- see this. Look, you see this all over the marketing world where people run in and fire the agency or just change oh. the ad campaign or you know, throw yeah, money yeah. at the problem. I mean, we just did a case on Budweiser where oh. there's like 16 different, well, four different panic things, each one of them managed badly. Yeah. And there, what's clear is there's no infrastructure process below it. Um, yeah. How do I put in a process? That makes this work with a company that's going into a crisis. I think we want to resist the urge to just get into that question straight away and make the make the real case of the fact that find out what's happening before you try and fix it. Hey, I like, agree with this. <laughs> yeah. Rather than go, Christ, we've got to go and fix all this. And how are we going to do it and rush on? Just have the bravery to hold the line. You know, if you look back at the, the world of war and martial stuff, you know, the what the, the companies are back in the Roman days. I love a good old uh, kind of Viking or Roman film on Netflix. But the the, the you know, if you watch um or Game of Thrones, when they're holding the line, you're thinking, God, that takes bravery, when everything's literally life and death. The army, the team that are gonna win are the team that bloody hold, have the bravery and the strategy and the confidence and the downright grit. Well, so, I, I do think I do think the other thing that you said that I don't want to let go is there's too much a lot of times, particularly in a high pressure situation, there's a desire to pick the problem out immediately without a lot of discussion about other possibilities of creating the problem and then immediately move to the answer. Yeah. Um, and then it will just repeat probably because you haven't worked out what caused it in the first place. Right. Well, look, this is my, one of my examples is all the marketers that come in and if, if they fire the agency, the creative agency as their first part of the job, they're telling the company, I am going to solve all your problems with the creative. When the problem may be value, competition, pricing, talent, customer experience. As soon as you do that, you have you have announced that you understand the problem. 
and that it is creative. So that so so how do you when you're when you're talking to people and I'm sure if you've watched a lot of people change companies, how do I figure out when my purpose and my five R's or whatever I want, what should I be doing when I'm going through an interview to see if I am going to fit in this company? Oh gosh, I could talk for a, a trillion podcasts on this one, Mike. Um I think preparation, 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 you know, really work out what, right. The reason why so many senior, uh, and I used to be a headhunter, so I know this world well, the reason why so many senior positions fail is because people don't stop to think before they act. Normally senior people are headhunted if they're good. Yeah. Normally yeah. they're getting headhunted and they're getting plucked from a place of, of um, success. So they haven't stopped and worked out what's my brief. What is my brief that I want going next? And therefore, they're they're in sell. They're being sold to. They're in they're in reaction mode. And someone comes along and goes, "This is amazing. It's pretty. Look how sparkly it is. It's going to be wonderful." And all the egos saying, "Oh, you want me to do that?" No, and you are going to save the company by coming with us. So yeah. So you're always in a reactive mode. Therefore, to does that problem they want me to solve for them sound okay to me? What people don't stop to do is go, "Hang on a minute. Let me just clarify." What do I want next? Regardless of this current business and this interview that I've been offered, let me just stop, get clear whilst I'm clean, as I haven't gone in yet and started to learn, et cetera. Let me get clear on what is it I want next for my career, my talent base, my growth, my happiness, and my wealth. They all come into it so that you've got that baseline I talk about to make informed um, reflection decisions upon. Because once you've gone into an interview, you are being sold to. <laughs> and yeah. so you're reacting and you haven't often stopped and gone, what do I want? Therefore, does it fit? Really often as well, interviewing and recruitment is a distress purchase because something's gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, Someone's just been headhunted or fired <laughs> yeah. or been poached to even a different part of the, of the same company, but something's changed. And often, because we're so in the immediacy and there's so many things to deliver and there's so much pressure and so little time, proper succession planning, proper creation of what is the job. And let's face it, who sits down and goes, goody, 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 I'm going to spec out a job right now <laughs> and work out exactly what's involved? Because I'm no, not- No, they, they pay a headhunter and the headhunter cuts and paste a yep. bunch of stuff. So, so I think this is really important. And I think the other thing you're alluding to is by figuring this out, you also got to figure out, can I actually do this? Or are they, and do they actually know what they want? Or yeah. am I going to walk into a buzzsaw where they think yeah. I'm going to fix a problem that they don't understand? There's another uh, point here, Mike, that I'd like just to interject if it fits for you. I think, because again, we're so out of date with how we set people up for success in senior change, because it's all about the 90 days, isn't it? What are your 90 days going to be? And then come in and just blow us away in 90 days or it's over, <laughs> you know, no pressure. But what we miss is what I call a golden window, which I think if we did this, oh my God, the success rate of senior people, especially CMOs would be radically altered. You have a magic window of your pre 30 days. Okay before you have joined, where you have the gift of not knowing, of being new, of thinking, right, how am I going to show up on day one as this new elevation? Because normally we go to roles that are more senior than the ones we're leaving. So there's a gap there in experience and there's a gap of um, a, not ability, but of that tried and tested, which is what you want. That's part of the joy. But do you, do you when you're doing that, sit down and go, right, on day one, what's the impact I want to land with the team? You know, what's my understanding of the job? How am I going to sense check that? How am I going to have the bravery to admit I don't know what I don't know? Okay. And how am I going to have patience aligned with delivery? Because I have to learn, I have to absorb. And also I say to people, it's such a gift being new, but no one's I, I agree with this. to hold it. Yeah. No one's there going, hold the line. Like don't this is also, this is, I also want to go back to your earlier point, which is this is where, if the job spec has already identified the problem and you accept it as the problem and it's not the problem, you are going to get shot <laughs> um, because you yeah. won't solve the problem, but you will enter saying, I get that this is the problem. And um, hey, yeah. can we talk about that entry? Because mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about imposter syndrome and I have a little runway run up on this one because 
almost every CMO I know has had some version of imposter syndrome. And and there's a lot of ways on how to management to manage it. You you have another thought on this though, which is you think there's some real imposter syndrome, but then you also have what I'm gonna call imposter imposter syndrome, which is <laughs> I think I need to say this because I don't wanna act like I know what I'm doing. So I'm gonna say I have imposter syndrome when I come in, even when I don't. This is an awful lot of imposter discussion, but <laughs> well, let's hear what you have to say on all of this imposter stuff. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's a it's a growing interest of mine because I think, hang on, when did it get signed off? Which department globally signed off that imposter syndrome is a thing? Okay, when it became like an exception. I think it was HR. I think HR signed <laughs> off on that. <laughs> or the L&D industry where you can make a lot of money having tools and techniques and courses to help you overcome your imposter syndrome because you have to have one. Because if you haven't got one, you're missing something. Even down to the point we're being advised, like, name it. <laughs> you know, talk to it every day. I mean, bloody hell, who'd want to do that? Why are we saying it's a good thing to always be focusing on the fact you carry all these doubts, worries, fears, and uh, demons, okay? Because an imposter syndrome is not your friend. <laughs> it's no, you what you just said sounds like a run-up to a horror movie. but okay. Well, isn't it? But no. You know, you're not going to go, oh, come and sit down, um, you know, Jane or John, because I really want to chat with my imposter syndrome right now. And, <laughs> you know, it's going to be so motivating. I'm going to come out of it feeling amazing. Like when anyone's thought about their imposter syndrome, they're naturally going to be adrenaline filled. They're going to have anxiety. Their stress system, their physiology is going to become anxious because the imposter syndrome, if it even exists, OK, if the myth of it even exists, it's a negative driver. So I talk about um, a towards and away from energy, and I'm not going to sound like a woo woo hippie here, but because I, I think it's really practical. But often, a high woo woo hippie, all right, woo woo yeah. hippie for a technical term. Because sometimes the minute you talk about energy and stuff like that, people go, "Oh god, it's a bit too fluffy." But it's bloody not. It's so fundamental to successful change. High performers have normally become high performers in a fast and shortened period because they have high fear. And it's their worries, it's their away from energy that drives them to say, if you don't do this, you're going to be in their shit. You know, you're right. going to. Or that's why you will wake up at six o'clock and do all the extra yeah, work. Yeah, because you're like, right, I'm going to do this. Because, yes. But here's the thing, Mike. If you're allowing fear to be a driver, which is aligned to all this imposter syndrome stuff, you can't, you always have to have part of your, your mindset, your subconscious, your thought process, your emotions focused on what worries you. You have to give it your attention to know it's not going to get you. All right. And that's why it drives you because you have to stay one step ahead of all that. What might happen? I might be a fraud. I might be found out. I might get fired. I might lose my house. I might get divorced. You know, people might leave me. Um, I might have to actually look at who I am really. Oh, that's awful. You know, so you just distract yourself with combating all this bloody horrible stuff behind you. And that makes you do this. I'm going to illustrate when I was watching visually is that you turn around. Part of you has got to be looking at it. So our connection now is not nearly as good, is it? You know, it's kind of broken. So for those listening, I turned my head away and I was looking behind me as I was speaking to Mike. So our connection is not broken, but it's not great. Right. And that fear driver is incredibly compelling because it's very successful. We are naturally pr prime, primed fight or flight. OK, so it's in our DNA to get away from danger and survive. But it's exhausting and it's crippling and it's very, very limiting because you'll never be happy. The, as, soon, as soon as you're allowing an imposter syndrome thing to be a driver for your growth, I guarantee you will never be. No, because you're always, really you're always afraid happy. of the late next team and that's going to show up. Though uh, one of the other things that can get you in trouble, particularly as a CMO, is if people think you are overconfident or that you think your team is special. And I think one of the ways to hide behind that, because you you get some marking people that will go, oh, yeah, well, you just don't understand this creative stuff, particularly like I do. That just is a light bulb for people to smash you. And oh. um, so so one of the things you have to be very careful of is you have to be confident, but not so confident you look like you are thinking your team is special. Um yeah. And, and I think some people use imposter syndrome to cover for that. It's an it's a get out of jail card, isn't it? It's not me. It's my imposter. Go speak to Johnny or Jane. Like I yeah, said, my imposter, you know? my, in, my imposter syndrome is talking now. It's not me. Exactly. Right. It's kind of taking away accountability and ownership, isn't it? Let me just quite slightly just give the opposite of that. So rather than fear energy, you want to be driven by what I call towards energy. 
where you yeah. are very clearly like this, moving towards your goals, your dreams, your hopes, your desires, fueled by confidence, not arrogance, but firm foundations. Now, obviously, we're all a work in progress, and that's great. But it's about coming from that place of clarity, confidence, and commitment to where you are going and what you will achieve and gain. And that fuels you rather than what you want to get away from. Well, that look, it's a lot like managing a football club at, at, at like Chelsea or Liverpool or something. Um, you, you're going to have to go win the game. You can think about all the ways you can lose it or you can go win it. And I, sure. think, I think you should go win it. Um, a, a couple of things here. Any special observations you would give our listeners on people in the CMO role or the head of agency role? I think let's not underestimate the reality of the pressure of those jobs. Yeah, they're hardcore <laughs> and they are exciting. They are a pinnacle of success. They are what people aspire to and they kind of go as fast and as hard as they can to get to that place and then kind of get there and go, God, it's hard. God, it's lonely. Is this even what I what Do I want this? This isn't what I thought. And they often don't have what's next, like the continuum to yeah. help them keep moving. And I think, you know, the more we can just allow people to cope with the now in those jobs, because it in agency leadership, in marketing leadership, it's all about what are you going to deliver, the next set of results. Well, in any leadership, isn't it? It's all about the future. But and the I marketing think, stuff, everyone can see how you are trying. Well, I wrote, when I was preparing for this, I thought what I wrote down is it's a very naked job. Marketing is a very naked. You can't hide anywhere and, and therefore that loneliness piece is even more amplified and that's why right back to where we started this conversation the time and the space for your you know, space and pace rather for your team you've got to start with yourself and I find that leaders CMOs agents leaders especially make their mistakes so I disagree fundamentally with Simon Sinek here that eat leaders should not eat last not at all and I know there's a lot of underpinning around that and what he actually means by the nuance but if you take it in its simplistic statement if you're not putting your own oxygen mask on first, making your health a priority, making your well-being, making your energy, your mental health, your clarity and confidence of decision making really primed and you're making yourself the best performer you can be. And that takes selfishness. And you know what? That's OK. <laughs> you cannot show up as your best self for all your other people if you're knackered, worried, full of self-doubt and exhausted and covering it brilliant because you're a high performer and you're just very good at multitasking. Um, once you go over under the hood, I think let's offer better support to people in those roles. Let's make that the badge of honor. It's coming, it's it's getting better, but you would not, it's a, such a cliche, so forgive me, but you would never have an Olympic athlete at the height of their performance without a whole goddamn team of dedicated experts working on that person or that team's talent. Yeah. Because talent is not enough. So you can carry it so far as a senior leader for talent to get you there. But there's a point in time where you're doing yourself and your business and your career and your leadership a massive disservice, choosing not to invest in the right experts to support you for that level of performance in that job. I and think I that's think a great, a great comment. Hey, Thank you. I, since we are almost <laughs> out of time, last question. Practical advice and or funniest story you can share on the air. You can pick both topics or one, but you have to pick at least one. So the practical advice has to be something we haven't talked about yet or funniest story you want to share on the air. Take it away. I'm so not going to try and be funny. <laughs> All right. I'll do that for both of us. Yeah, that's that's uh, not my skill set in storytelling. Um so, and I'm known for my, I joke, for those who know England and regions, I'm Yorkshire, okay? And Yorkshire people are known as being very practical, say what you say, say what you see and get stuff done. So practical is much better for me. And um, I thought it might be helpful. I actually put together a document for um, the Institute of Practitioners of Advertising at the IPA in the UK. They've just launched an Adlands Wellbeing lab, uh, lab sorry, which is relevant whether you're brand or agency side. And they asked me to author a document for them about practical advice for well-being. And I felt that would fit the tone of what we're speaking about. So I want to share uh, these five key stages that I put together, which I hope practically, if if your listeners choose to do this, I guarantee you'll get better results. <laughs> OK, All right, let's let's hear Just do one let's... of these and you're going to get better results. So you start by reflecting on what's gone before the now. 
So you're just really up to date with your current world that you're working in, because a lot of people aren't when it comes down to leadership and growth. Be honest then for about how up to date are you about who you are and where you are in your career and leadership? Who are you right now? Most of us don't know that answer. Most of us are scared to find out, actually, in case we find ourselves lacking. Yeah, I could uh, be an imposter, imposter. <laughs> okay. No, they've gone, Mike. We've banished them. They're not here. Okay, the third one? It's find three key areas of leadership growth that you can and want to commit to in 2024. Three areas. Get that clear in your own mind. To enable that to happen, number four is make time for yourself. All right. If you're not fueling your own self, you're going to burn out. It's fact. All right. You might mask it, but it will come and get you. And the last thing is number five, consistency is key. So if you're not ready to commit to any of this because you're not in a place, be consistent in saying no. Yeah. Make the decision not to kid yourself. But whatever you do commit to when it comes to your growth or that of your team, whatever you put on the table, don't do it unless you're prepared to commit and be consistent. So oh, thank, reflect. Thank you for those. Oh, go on. Then. You've got them. But I will say, if you know, people have my contact details. There's a whole load of stuff to help you on how to do that. That is free. And this is super consistent with what we've heard from some of our other guests, which is don't try to take on the job in its entirety immediately. Two, if you don't have curiosity and ability to recharge, the job will kill you. Um, so I, I think this is very consistent. So thank you for that as an ending. Thank you, Sally, for joining the show. And thanks, everyone, for listening to CMO Confidential. Look for our other shows on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, which include What Your Agency Wants to Tell You But Won't, Parts 1, 2, and 3. Also, Behind Closed Doors, Part 1, Chaos in the Media Park in the media marketplace and a venture capitalist talks about artificial intelligence hey all you marketers stay safe out there this is mike linton signing off for cmo Confidential.